This episode is brought to you by Gamefly, the best way to rent or buy your favorite games. Listen! Welcome, welcome, welcome to Nintendo Voice Chat, episode 381. My name is Philip Mewson, and today we have a bunch of of Switch updates and news and a ton of games coming out this week. I'm super excited about, and I'm joined, uh, let's see, I'll start to my right here with, I think you guys have met this (laughs) wonderful man before. His name is Per Schneider. Hello. Thanks for having me on the show. Great this to have is, you this here. This is my today, first Pear. time on NVC. <laughs> Very excited to be joining. The Good pool. job, finally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank and you. Thank you. Over to my far left, let's go over to Zach Ryan. How are you it's doing me. today? I'm all, right. I'm all right. I'm good. Cool. Look, I'm. You okay? You're a little down. Is that because that one block? Well, I was in trying Mario to get this, down, I was or? trying to get the Jaxi block in the Sand Kingdom, right. and I just uh, I missed it twice, and right. it just really bummed me out. All right. Well, and other than that, I'm doing fine. If thank you me. want us to do it for you, just let let us know. Don't patronize me, Pear. Don't patronize me. And over right here to my direct left um, is Mr. Brian Altano. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. I only have three moons left in Mario Odyssey, and they're all tied to Bound Ball, which is the worst. (laughs) So I'm basically not playing Mario Odyssey. I'm basically playing a shovelware game at this point. Why don't you just buy three moons from... It doesn't count. count. You can't do it. It doesn't count. You've got to get the the little check marks next to everything. I mean, you don't... got to light up that last light on the Odyssey. Anyway. All right. Good, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, before we break into our main topics today, um, I did want to read one of our iTunes reviews because this podcast solely runs off of iTunes reviews, uh, five stars only, yeah. right? So definitely make fuel. sure if you have time. It's, it's the power mu- moons yeah. to our <laughs> yeah. iTunes odyssey. Yeah. That's basically what uh, keeps all of us going. We don't need food. We just need iTunes reviews. That's true. I, and I eat them. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to read one left by Mr. Ryan Darmos. Uh, he said, top notch dudes, five stars. I always love listening to this podcast. Podcast. Each personality brings something to the table, and I'm 100% confident that you guys convinced me to buy a Switch. When Brian Boitano was in the Olympics skating for the gold, he did two slot shows and a triple Lutz while wearing a <laughs> blindfold. Is Good man. Great. Yeah. Do you get the Boitano thing a lot? Uh, not anymore. Not it's often. over now, huh? Yeah. You know what? Because I think I outlived that dude. Brian. No, he's still oh, alive. Really? No, is he's... He? He must be still. I think he is yeah. still yeah. alive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, well, you know he's out. Triple Lutz tri- he's somewhere. out. Triple Lutz Sydney and double Salchos. So <laughs> I think we're let's even. take a moment to talk about these uh, random Snapple facts in this review. If you're leaving us an iTunes review, please say some glowing remarks about each of us. Mm-hmm. But then also tell us something that we didn't know, like yeah. this Brian Boitano fact. Yeah, yeah, very good. That's yeah. nice. Cool. Yeah. The blindfold thing. Right. That's interesting. Awesome. Very cool. So uh, let's <laughs> go ahead and easily segue right into our first um, major topic, I guess, of the of the week. And we just had a Xenoblade 2 Direct where we learned a bunch of new information. Um, we got some Zelda DLC mm-hmm. uh, just today, actually, as mm-hmm. of our recording. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Ooh, nine, I gotta go get I that. Believe. Oh, yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah, so did any of you guys get a chance to play it at all, the DLC? It actually launched at midnight last night. Not no, I didn't have a chance between then and now, but um, it's... I, I slept. Did you guys read about how to get it? It's effect- effectively like these, like, sort of, like, l- objects have landed at three separate locations throughout the world, and you have to go find them. Yep. I think what, like... Are they marked? an invasion. Yeah. yeah, so, well, they're, they're like, clues that you get. So, like, an objective will pop up in your quest log, like it always does. Um, and then you get some weird, like, sort of assless chat pants that you get that show the sides huh. of, uh, uh, of Link's legs. And that it's but sort you've of been asking for those, so finally. Since day one, yeah, yeah day zero. Yeah. Uh, but it's they're they're kind of Kingdom Heartsy the yeah. costume. Like it's obviously Xenoblade, but um, I'd be more interested in like a cool new sword or something like that. So I don't, I didn't know if that's necessarily I thought, part of. It. Wasn't there a weapon included? I hope so. With the whole armor set, I think that you do end up getting the Xenoblade. I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Yeah. I, I actually haven't even started it myself. Yep. But um, I do know that. Um, you can get the full armor set, right? And then once you do get all of that, it gives it gives you a pretty good buff, right? Once you equip everything, I think yeah. like certain items have to be upgraded, but it seems cool. Zach, did you check it out at all? I haven't checked it out. Um, I I want to. I I'm glad that it's actually tied to a side quest and not just like one of the things that sort of not bummed me out, but I thought that they could have done a little bit better in the first DLC for Breath of the Wild was they just dropped a bunch of chests into the world and were like, hey, here's where all that gear is. Go find it. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily like they weren't tied to specific quests. That was literally how the season pass thing worked. Yeah. So I like that this one makes you work for it a little bit and it gives you a little more incentive to get back into yep. Breath of the Wild yeah. and into that world. Like I, I don't care about the Zeno, the Zeno Saga or Zeno Gear. Uh, uh, Zeno <laughs> or Blade. Blade. Zeno Blade. Even the titles uh, even. You don't yeah. like, really. G- uh, armor, yeah. but uh, You're a bit of I do a xenophobe. Think, I do think that it's uh, Xenomorphs. I do think yeah. that it's it's cool that there's a 
lengthy quest that Could, couldn't have couldn't on. have predicted this one though like i i didn't even think about the fact that they that they're doing these these kind of tie-in promos it's it's a welcome surprise i think it's really cool i'm gonna boot it back up do you think that it's a little backwards like huh. do you think that putting link in uh xenoblade armor is not as useful as it would have been to put like zelda dlc into xenoblade like i feel like you know, like, I don't know, like, as a, as a bigger Zelda give, fan and Zelda give, being a bigger franchise. Like, give them time. Right? I, yeah, maybe yeah, they'll yeah. return the favor. Yeah. I mean, I think that because Xenoblade is, what, like, a month away, um, they probably, like, this is N Nintendo's chance to sort of bring awareness to that. You yeah. know, like, everybody's going to load up, you know, Breath of the Wild, or they'll see that, you know, something automatically downloaded. Totally. They're and gonna, then, oh, Xenoblade Quest, what's Xenoblade if they don't yeah. know what it's about? Sure. Well, well you take one now. look at those assless chaps, and I mean, you're probably in, like, Who could playing. refuse, yeah. right? That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm sorry that I said the wrong name. There's a lot of Xeno games. It's fine. I'm sorry. Um, I'm apologizing to you out yeah. there. Well, well, we're gonna make you play it. It's just 120 I'm, hours so to finish. Talking about the the um, direct that happened mm -hmm. this week, like I, I'm excited to play it. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that one of the last check boxes on the Switch this year is like a really deep JRPG. So let's have it. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My only worry is that I might I might get stuck in Skyrim. And then literally, there's like another might get stuck in the geometry in Skyrim. happens but, a lot. Um, yeah, but uh, no, it's awesome. I, I think it's great. Too much, too many games to play. That's that's so cool. Well, it's like one thing that there's all feeling. these games to play, but there's also all these other games that are making me go back to them. Yeah. Not making me, but it, they're nudging me. And I think like with the Zelda DLC coming eventually, right? Probably this year. Yep. We keep hearing it's this year. Uh, yeah. And then the stuff that just launched now, it's like. Okay, well, like I want to start playing a bunch of these new games, but all the old ones keep pulling me back. I had the same thing with you and I were playing Horizon just the other day. Yeah. Which I wouldn't have guessed uh, with all the new games coming out, but I'm glad I went back. Yeah, know? me too. Did yeah. you review the first Xenoblade? Um, no, the last I didn't. one. No. I actually, I haven't ever completed a Xenoblade game yeah. before. He, so uh, you I'm, didn't pay. You didn't play for two hundred and seventy-five thousand hours to finish the Xenoblade. Unfortunately, it's an no. average completion time. Some <laughs> people are a little faster. Yeah, it's a two yeah. full calendar years. Yeah. But I am running through um, the 3DS version uh, right now. So. Oh, cool! Yeah, I'm excited. What are you, why are you doing that to yourself? Wasn't that version like pretty bad? No. Um, no, I think it's fine. Good. Was it? Yeah. yeah. You think of reason? Hyrule Warriors. Yeah, but that was one of the only other games that needed the new, new 3DS, 3DS yeah. processor, right? They're, they're I mean, it's yeah. not its they're not like, like five. It's not at the same level on a technical like aspect, sort of like the Wii U version, but it's like mm -hmm. t a totally comparable port. Yeah, it's good. Like The resolution gets a little a little not great when you're like really far from things. You know, you can't tell if it's like a if tree or a put the 3DS guy. like really far away from you. That's the trick. It's really, yeah. really small. Yeah, I play you most know, of my 3DS yeah. games through a telescope. Yeah, that's Which <laughs> just gets me even more excited, you know, by the fact that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Perfect. is coming out on Switch and we're going to be able to have that option to, you know, play it at home on TV or yeah. just take it portably yeah. with us on it's the really go. Cool. It's incredible. Yeah, um, I played this game at uh, Gamescom. And then I think we played it again at PAX. Yeah. Was that one of us? We previewed it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's got a lot going for it. It's really ambitious. It's gigantic. It's everything you want from it. The battle system is legitimately like heavy duty serious. Like it's not one of those like sort of run up on an enemy, jam on them, grind and move on to the next one. You engage in a battle in this game and it's a, it's an event. It's yeah. a whole thing. The, so. the depth of this battle system is insane. And yeah. in the direct... Uh, they spent a good portion of the time talking about the battle system and how it works and like how the character upgrades work and the way that they were like stacking terms on top of terms. I saw this in the, the uh, NVC podcast forums on Facebook. People were like, uh, is anybody else really intimidated by Xenoblade 2? Because yeah, totally. it looks really, yeah. really deep. So thank you so, for saying that. So Andrew, Andrew played it a bunch. He couldn't join today, but he's got a full preview of the game up. Um, by the time you watch this, yeah, he's he got was, a really cool developer walkthrough. Very excited about the uh, over the battle system. He, yeah, he said he's it's really, really. He's cool. one yeah. of those people that can, like a lot of JRPG fans, can really lock into a system that gets this intense, right? And yep. really pull apart the minutia of it, collect every little thing. Mm -hmm. He's a total completionist when it comes to games too. So I see yeah, him even cool. falling even further down the well here. But with me, as someone who like sort of nowadays only casually plays RPGs, I did find the system intimidating. But I also found myself like sort of growing to it after a little while so i yeah. think there's gonna be a lot here and yeah this is like zach said like we're kind of missing this gigantic jrpg on the system you know yeah. the last one we really had was like i am setsuna and that's such a different situation it's a small it's, it's a small big game yeah yeah this exactly. is i mean this is a big this is a big, big game. rpg yeah in the works for you know many many months so yep. it's pretty cool but you've been playing a, a different game for a while huh 
Yes, I have been working on my review for a little game, little AAA shooter called Doom, actually, Doom? for Switch. Yeah. Is this your first IGN really review? This up. is my very first IGN awesome. review, yeah. So I'm really, really excited. Um, it should be, by the time this podcast is out, that should be out as well. So you guys should be able to check it out. Um, I you guess had, we can talk about yeah, everything. Yeah. You had one of those great moments that are, to me, like... When I when I think about IGN, why I love it, and you know, when years from now, when I'm a retired old man, and I think about, I look back on like my favorite moments from IGN. It's um, when something is happening in the office that attracts a large group of people to kind of stand around and gawk at. Yeah. And sometimes that's a negative thing where we're like, oh man, this doesn't look good. But sometimes like this, you were playing the Switch version of Doom. And everyone gathered around a big 4K television to watch you play this game. And we all just were sort of like, it's Doom. Yeah. They did it. Yeah. yeah. Like, and to me, I think it, it what it surmised was that the, a lot of the excuses that we have historically heard, heard from third parties about not being able to port things here and there when it comes to Nintendo and their underpowered consoles, uh, that's kind of gets thrown out the window here. They kind of make it look easy, right? Obviously, yeah, they, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a step down, right? You noted this in the review. It's 30 frames per second, not 60. Right. Some of the sheen is missing. Yeah, right. But it, but it runs nicely and it feels right. Right. I think it's a completely um, competent port of Doom. You know, yeah. I think it works excellent on Switch. Obviously, you're not going to get, you know, the high fidelity graphics that we'd get like on a PC or PS4, or Xbox One. Um, but that doesn't really matter because the gameplay itself is what is very is the selling point for this game and the game is a lot of fun and it's perfect on switch because it does have that sort of pick up and play mentality mm -hmm. like there is a great story in doom i really enjoyed yeah. doom's story but at the same time it's not something that you really have to pay attention to and it's so, got that arcade mode on top of it too, yeah right? there's yeah. an arcade mode yeah. in there it's got the multiplayer the yeah. only thing it's missing is the snap map editor which right. i think or I think it would have been a pretty cool to have that option because the you know the Switch is such a social system to be able to like play with each other like that and share maps with each other. I wonder if that's the kind of scenario where Bethesda is sort of watching to see how well this one resonates and if they have time to add that kind of stuff later. Because I know the multiplayer aspects of this game are sort of a piecemeal download from everything else, right? When you buy the game or you download the game, you're only really getting the single player. And the multiplayer is a completely separate download on top of everything else. So if they're analyzing it like that and there's like the single player, multiplayer, maybe the snap map thing is something that can show up down the line if uh, if a bunch of people buy this game. Yeah, I could definitely see something like that happen. Yeah. It's cool. Uh, and how does it perform in... Docked? In handheld mode. Oh, yeah, handheld? It, yeah. So I played it handheld. Mm. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't played it docked yet. You obviously played it both. But handheld, I was. it's just surprising when you see the game run that it's on this this thin I know. thing, right? Like, it's amazing. I, but when, you, when you put this even next to some of the redesigned smaller consoles, it's like it's so tiny and it's running this game that is, is pretty damn good looking lighting-wise and everything. Yeah. yeah. If you're watching the video version of this podcast, you're seeing the... Uh, IGN graphics comparison that we made between the Switch, PC, Xbox One, and yeah. PS4. Yep. And it reminds me a lot, like, graphically of uh, the beginning of this console cycle when we saw games that came out for PS3 and PS4 yeah. or Xbox 360 and Xbox One. Um, the fidelity isn't too far off. Like, no, no, I, no, no, no. It's a little muddier. That uh, You ran into some frame issues. Philip, like you docked. ran into a little. There were a some few frame stutters. rate issues. Yeah, actually, you know, it didn't seem to matter if I was playing docked or undocked. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, um, was a little bit of slowdown. Right, they weren't. Yeah. Um, they weren't too clear on you know what the exact resolution was. Um, so to me, it appears to be dynamic, uh -huh. and with you know, and it caps out at 720p. Um, whether or not you're playing in TV mode, and of course in handheld <laughs> mode good, as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you're playing in TV mode, especially if you have a big screen TV, you're gonna see those lower resolution textures. I mean, even something like the crosshair itself. Yeah. is a little blown out and that can be a little annoying while you're playing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was I was going to say in terms of that like I think that's what that that's what makes Doom sort of a great choice for the kind of first really genuinely premier first person shooter on the Nintendo Switch because I think something like Call of Duty that is so much more uh like influenced or hinges on like sort of ranged weaponry a lot of times you have a lot of sniper mm -hmm. rifle stuff. Doom is such an up close and personal melee driven game. It's about shotguns, it's about just really smashing that dude's face in and you yeah. got to be there for that and i think the resolution loss when it comes to hitting enemies from a uh, from a distance could be sort of a cumbersome thing especially on the on the switch screen at 720p but i think for the for what they're going with here i think it's a fantastic you know what what else makes it perfect 
What? No trees. <laughs> trees are notoriously difficult to do, and on you know the the more hardware power you have, obviously the better and the yeah. more detail you can put into them. So game on Mars is perfect. Yeah, no it's trees. great. That's why Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild zero trees. It okay. does have trees, not but they're not one. amazing. No, they're not trees. Great. Let's be honest, yeah. right? If we were to rank yeah. the the greatest trees in video games, which I'm sure we will. Yeah. At was, some point before this website we'll get, gets we'll, shut down. Just, hold tight. We'll, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> we got right. one more. I don't know if Breath of the yeah. Wild will be up there. Uh, cool. So people can find your review on IGN. I've yeah. uh, heard of this site. Yeah. Yep. Yep. IGN. I'm sure it'll be on YouTube as well. Yeah, yep. Sure. Yep. 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 And our graphic comparison as well, if you want to see what that That's up like. now. Yeah. yeah. You can check that out. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm what excited to start that. Yeah. And then, so what else is coming out this week? It looks like we have another smaller game, another indie title called L.A. Noir. Yeah. Um, yeah that's La Noire. That. It's a French yeah. game. <laughs> <La Noire. laughs> um, we did have someone um, from IGN go and check out the game, but unfortunately, none of us did get a chance to go and check it out on Switch. Yeah, that's out next week. So I'm interested in trying that. I'm kind of amazed at the... Uh, the, we talk about this all the time, but like the download sizes of these games are starting to get ridiculous. They I mean, get this, bigger and bigger, yeah. This is like a fifth of your, if you have a 200 gigabyte SD card like I have, this is like a fifth of it. Yeah, right. So, yeah. so the, the new stuff that they showed um, were the the touchscreen controls. Yep. So you can actually now pick the, uh, you know, uh, the resolutions to interviews on the touchscreen if you're playing it in handheld mode, uh, which is actually really nice. And like if you haven't played LA Noir, it looks like an open world game, but really the map is more about like, Getting around and, get, and soaking in that atmosphere of old LA and finding all these landmarks from uh, from yesterday. Um, most of the game is crime scene investigation. You know, talking to people, chasing people. Sh uh, there's some shooting. But the investigation, uh, the the interview parts are really cool because you have to call people on their lies. You have to watch people's eyes and their behavior. And I haven't really seen a game like that before. Or right. since. Um, yeah. Or since. Yeah. And like, you know, they uh, they prided themselves when it first came out on the kind of the facial animations and the, you know, they, it's got that uncanny valley thing going, but like on their eyes and mm -hmm. expressions. And so now you can actually pick on the screen. You can say, oh, this guy's lying. So they make it much easier and faster, which uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to playing this version. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. really happy we're seeing some Rockstar support on Switch. I love the games they make, uh, especially this era of games that was sort of like the bully table tennis L.A. Noir era. Yeah, I, wish yeah. I wish they'd bring Bully to Switch. Me too, me yeah. too. Uh, it's such a weird diagonal from the their usual sort of big violent open world games. Um, this is still a violent game and it still has some open worldy stuff to it, but it's so cool and so interesting. Yeah. And I didn't play this a ton when it first came out. So I'm I'm definitely interested in trying it out again. Uh, did you know that the Switch version has uh, seven new fedoras? Is that true? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> seven new fedoras for your uh, policeman to wear. So, right, so yeah. It was a great time for fedoras. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, uh, you have to collect uh, purple... Uh, Purple hamburgers in order to buy them. That's right. The you gotta get them from yeah. the store. And I was thinking about what's a what's an LA food? It's like there's nothing. Hamburgers. Sorry. <laughs> LA doesn't have any cigarettes. No, yeah. like tacos. Come on, those are so and cigarettes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, no. Yeah. LA Noir is a game that I actually missed. Also, yep. so I'm really looking forward to checking it out on Switch as well. But a game that I actually did play a lot of, and I'm still looking forward to playing even more so on Switch, and it's coming out this week, yep. is Rocket League. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were gonna say Sonic. Oh, yeah, no. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> Sonic is not my jam. You're not digging it? No. All right, no. let's talk Rocket League then. No, but Rocket yeah. League, I, I am incredibly excited for. Um, I do, I've played a ton of Rocket League on PC. Um, I never got too much into the competitive scene. I always just played it casually for yeah. fun. Um, but I'm, I'm super excited the fact that we're getting like special Nintendo DLC, like we're getting the Metroid car. That Metroid car is so yeah. cool. I know, I love this it. Is, I mean, this is the game to bring, if you have a friend with a Switch, bring it to the movies bring it to Disneyland bring it anywhere like mm -hmm. you have to actually wait for something because you can play two player versus right mm -hmm. wherever you are which is awesome and then uh, you know kudos to, to the developer they didn't cut any corners it runs at 60 yeah. on the Switch and it's got cross platform, cross -platform multiplayer it's, uh, uh, these are the kinds of ports that we need to see more of. Mm -hmm. Where, I, yeah, this is. Well, I think one of the most fascinating things to come out of this, like sort of Nintendo Switch, Nintendo Renaissance era, uh, is that they do have an under, like an underpowered console. But all of these developers are finding these incredible ways to tell these stories 
uh, at reduced resolutions with like a smaller, you know, sm smaller storage space and not exactly the best like online infrastructure. They're finding like, I don't as somebody, I've always been sort of fascinated in like that kind of demake culture or like taking games and uh, making them run on different platforms yep. at different resolutions. Like a lot of really cool, interesting stories are coming out from like a technical level of but how the, they're doing this. But the diff it's a difference, you know, if you remember, we got some of that on the 3DS as well, where you yeah. get the Lego yeah. games on the 3DS, but the step down isn't that big. Yeah. And so, I you mean, know, the platform, the hardware is competent enough to run a game like Doom and do it justice, but it also encourages indies with 2D games to actually create them, release them on this platform, yeah. and some of them are thriving, so that's great. How much of the the this sort of like architecture and stuff is coming from Nintendo themselves, right? Like Nintendo, last this last generation has proved that they're kind of the masters of this stuff. We were just talking about Xenoblade on uh, 3DS, right? Yeah. Uh, Yoshi's Woolly World, uh, Hyrule Warriors less so, but like... <laughs> Nintendo has done a really bang up job of like moving them, moving some games from one system to a smaller one, so or sure. a less powerful one. So yeah. like, yeah, I could see them supporting yeah. a lot of developers and doing the same. Lots sounds of, like uh, sounds like we're all looking forward to it, right? So yeah. oh yeah, for sure. It's if you like multiplayer games, like insane kind of like Mario Kart battle mode fun, you you have you have to get this game. And it's if you like all League the is so well thought out and controlled so amazingly well, you liked all the unlockable hats that Zach <laughs> just made up in yeah. L.A. Noir. There's Tons of unlockable yep. hats in this game. You could yeah, put a sombrero yeah. on the car. There's upwards of nine cars in that game. At right? least nine hats and cars. Yep. So that's what it says on the box. <laughs> well, we're going to take uh, a minute here and take a quick break. And joining us after the break is going to be a very, very special guest. Uh, so stick around. Here we go. Welcome back, everyone, from our short a uh, small break. And we have our guest here joining us today. And we're joined with Mr. Julian... Egebrecht. Egebrecht. Very, yeah. <laughs> you did very good. Oh, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. All right. <laughs> that cool. was pretty good. Yeah. Um, and you are actually the president of Factor 5 and also the vice president of technology, technology, technology. at Hulu. Yes, I am. Yeah. Which is incredible, which yeah. we actually just got a Hulu app on Switch today, but mm -hmm. we'll maybe talk more about that later. We're way more interested right now in hearing more about the Super Turrican NT Director's Cut that is going to be released on the Super NT, correct? Or it is released? That That is correct. Well, when the when the Super NT comes out. Comes up, correct. Fe February, I think. Uh, February-ish, yes. For, for every, by the way, we're, we're both German, so we both can't pronounce February. We're just going to say that right now, <laughs> right? Try it. <laughs> February. See? February. Yeah. We got oh, it. that's great. Um, I yeah. want a Super cut of that <laughs> but like the so the super nt is basically it's a it's a, a piece of hardware um that runs super nes games at 1080p um Correct. that um it doesn't use software em emulation it's all done in hardware right right that's that's the big difference um i guess from from most of the other attempts that have been done and even even uh, the difference to what nintendo is doing um with their mini um is that it's a hardware emulator and it's not even an, an hardware emulator but um you really have to say it's a simulator um so the the hardware chip in there the um, fpga um is really simulating every single um, circuit that was in a real Super Nintendo awesome. um, and is doing it on a level which is absolutely one to one. So, and that's why the thing costs 190 bucks when it comes out. Right? I think, it's, yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty. It's a, a pretty reason, it. It's a pre pretty reasonable price compared to what what the analog guys uh, did last time. Yeah. Um, sure. Because if you remember, um, the their NES um, version of this um, was a lot more expensive. So I was actually stoked about the price. So how is it that uh, for decades now we've had emulated Super Nintendo games, and there's they're always so incredibly challenging to just get right. You would think like, oh, this game is 25 years old, plug it in, uh, download the ROM, get it running, and, it, and it's good to go. But forever we've seen hiccups and stuff like Yoshi's Island, anything with some Mode 7 stuff. Mm -hmm. um, how did you guys sort of work around all of those issues? Um, well, I wasn't involved too much, but I'm, I'm um, reasonably well on top of the uh, the tech in the um, in the device. Um, the, the trick is that you really need to simulate um, each and every circuit, which is in the hardware, um, at the same time and with the same time. And you can do that in these FPGA um, simulations, but you cannot do that or it's practically impossible with current computing power in pure software, um, which would be a typical emulator running on an ARM chip or an Intel mm -hmm. chip. And with that, the problem is that you always have differences in timing and something always goes wrong because uh, we developers back then squeezed out every little bit um, out of the Super Nintendo and, and uh, the, the early consoles at the time. Um, I mean, nowadays you can simulate 
simulate a little bit easier mm -hmm. um, because the systems are so complex, you can't really go down to the metal anymore. But right. back then we did. So we figured out and sometimes accidentally tripped the weirdest timings in those in those boxes. Mm. And that's what then hits you when you try to emulate in software. So you, and did you know the analog guys? Like the, the whole connection. So analog makes this box. You guys made this game Super Turrican. And I, mm -hmm. I remember, you know, uh, when we first met, I think you guys were working on Rogue Squadron, actually. Probably. And I yeah. visited your office up in Marin County near Skywalker Ranch up there and uh, mm -hmm. uh, was amazed at what you guys were doing with the N64, <laughs> then went back and played Super Turrican. And I was like, oh, okay, well, these guys clearly know their tech. You guys were squeezing out a lot. But there's a story behind that game, and you guys actually had to... I don't want to say dumb it down, but you had to pare it down for the Super NES. Right? We had to cut it down. Um, it, it was funny. We we actually worked on Super Turrican um, actually at one of my partners um, in his in his childhood bedroom still um, in 1992. Um, in Cologne, Germany. Um, so that was before we hooked up with LucasArts and started working with them, um, and later on Lucasfilm. Um, but yeah, so we worked in his bedroom, and uh, we worked and worked and worked, and at some point, um, our publisher at the time says, well, uh, we would like to have the whole thing in four megabits. And we always thought, ah, oh, come on, they will never insist on that, because um, at the time, if you looked at the Konami titles, if you looked at uh, Nintendo First Party, but even most of the third party titles, I mean, I think Street Fighter II was just, just around the corner and that was uh, 16 megabits. Huh. So we thought, ah, come on. It, 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 we will get an 8 megabit And, and yours is, a, if you're not familiar with the games, right, they're side-scrolling Contra-like games, yeah, right? Yeah, with exactly. actual levels, so it's not like Street Fighter, which has a... a a, a, set a pretty stage. contained, yeah. a pretty contained stage, yeah. So, so four megabits were, were pretty um, horrible, um, <laughs> and and so we were optimistic, youthful and optimistic. And uh, I think we stopped developing the game only at the point when we ran out of money, um, which is the most likely scenario. Um, it's it's a little bit foggy thirty years on, um, <laughs> but uh, but. Uh, we sat there and it was six megabits at the time. So it was too, too much. And uh, so the problem with it uh, really was that um, we then went on, found publishers for the different territories. But the US one, which was a um, almost, I think nowadays, completely unknown company called Seika, they actually insisted on the four megabits. We had for Japan, we had Hudson Soft. And Hudson Soft actually was totally gung ho with eight, huh. but didn't help because, of course, the US market was the most important one. Oh, wow. So, um, so so they enforced it with um, uh, the company which was financing the whole thing um, for us. They enforced the four megabits and we sat there and then spent the miserable few weeks before Christmas chopping our own game uh, down. And uh, at but, some But did you keep did you have an original version that was done and then you chopped or like what is this we, thing so that so we're this thing now? what we have here um <laughs> i found on a on a disc on a diskette um a 3.5 inch floppy um, as we called them back then um uh, actually in the early 2000s i believe um and i found it at home and it basically said uh super Turrican, uh 6m uh, mbit and was wow we kept that because i thought it was lost um mm -hmm. i wow. thought that back then we were scrambling so much that the whole thing would be gone. Um, but no, lo and behold, um, we hooked up a disk drive to a PC, <laughs> which we still had around in the archive um, at, at Factor 5. And uh, and there it was. And since then, I had it essentially on my hard drive and didn't know what to do with it yet, because we were always looking for, for some, some special occasion. Um, mm. And we thought we had that finally when Nintendo launched the Virtual Console back oh. then on the Wii. And um, uh, we talked to NOA at the time and basically said, um, hey, can we have uh, Super Turrican, Super Turrican 2, and then from the Sega side, Mega Turrican on the Genesis on Virtual Console? And they said, yeah, absolutely. Um, why not? Um, and then I pitched the idea of um, why don't we do something special? Um, we bundle somebody who buys all three games or the two Super Nintendo titles gets as a bonus uh, the director's cut, the original version. And um, NOA loved the idea, um, but then uh, Nintendo Japan stepped in because at the time the policy was absolutely strictly that only titles could be released on Virtual Console which were released exactly like that in the marketplace before. And apparently it came from Iwata-san personally. Um, uh, so we, we pleaded and we backed and everything, but at the end of the day, they, they didn't want to budge. So opportunity lost. The games still, the original games came out 
um, on Virtual Console. Was that, was that like an, an, an idea of just like the labeling of what it was? Because I know we saw like sort of like original Bomberman games um, under the WiiWare label. Like, was it just calling it a virtual console? Or QA. Console game? I mean, like, maybe they were worried that these games hadn't gone through QA. And yeah, yeah, that is yeah. that is something. I mean, um, of course, and we we found some some anomalies um, with which we would have been bounced out, I believe, um, uh, because some of the code wasn't wasn't quite that good in terms of the sound chip. Um, but nevertheless, there was no reason why they couldn't have have published it. It was simply a policy thing. And again, um, opportunity lost. Then we once again were basically uh, focused more on current things. And then um, Analog came around. Um, Chris Tabor, the um, the head of Analog, actually contacted me, when was that, six years ago, when they did their Neo Geo, um, their gorgeous Neo Geo uh, variants with uh, made out of wood, right? Um, which was the first thing they did, even before their NES clone. And uh, he contacted me and said, um, I've, I've read about this, um, because I think I had talked about it in interviews, or we had it on the webpage, actually, um, that it existed. And uh, can't we make a cartridge out of it? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't too hot about the cartridge idea because that's so hardcore. Um, I mean, how many people really um, still have the units around for yeah. that, um, the old units? So um, we lost content. And we should say the Super NT has a cartridge slot. Of course, yes. But the yes. game is actually pre-installed. The game is pre-installed, and not only Super Turrican Director's Cut is pre-installed, also Super Turrican 2 is uh, pre-installed. Okay. We threw that in, and nice. that's unchanged. That's the that's the original version mm -hmm. as, it, as it came out back then. But yeah, th those are the two uh, pre-installed games. Um, everything else you have to bring yourself, but of mm -hmm. course you have a system at that moment, and you can go to any um, flea market. Um, you were going to say Funko Land just now, weren't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do like that aspect of it, though, because you guys are effectively like nudging people to go out and start collecting Super Nintendo cartridges. We are, and that's yeah. actually the passion um, which which uh, Chris from Analog really and 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 the whole gang at Analog really wants to express is the um, we don't only want to preserve um, and and not even preserve perfectly as Nintendo does it, unfortunately, um, the top 20 games of the system, but we want to preserve the system and everything that entailed it. Also the experience that you actually have a cartridge and you plug the cartridge right, in. Right, right, right. Um, so that's that's uh, something they feel extremely strongly about. And But so, but fa Factor 5 doesn't exist anymore, right? Well, it does exist. Um, the company the company exists in... in it's a in, phantom menace. It's out there somewhere. Uh, it's out there. It's a it's a legal entity and, and um, uh, it exists in email... Uh, addresses. Um, you can email me still at, okay. at, at Julian at Factor5.com. I, I heard there's a Twitter <laughs> account for Factor Five. Is that true? There, there's a Twitter account. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's um, like, how did you, how did you guys find to each other? Like, how did you find the analog guys making the machine? Um, it, Chris, how did you get together? Chris actually contacted me okay. um, earlier this year again, um, Chris Tabor from Analog, uh, and said, um, "Well, you can probably imagine um, what we're doing, knowing what Nintendo, of course, was working on." Yeah. Um, and I had uh, finally seen one of their uh, um, one of their consoles, when actually my son gave me for my birthday um, last year um, the uh, the original, the um, their their NES clone, and uh, even the Famicom, um, the gorgeous red Famicom version of that, the Japanese version of it, um, and I loved it. Um, played all of my NES cards on it um, from my collection, um, so I knew that these guys would be in for quality. That mm -hmm. was for me the most important thing. I mean, we certainly have been contacted uh, many times over by. Um, some of these, shall we say, um, not quite so official um, collection boxes, um, which are floating around um, on the net in, in a more or less legal or illegal fashion. And we always turned them down or basically mm -hmm. just ignored the requests. But but when Chris recontacted me um, about the whole thing, I was completely gung-ho because that was the perfect opportunity. And you guys, I mean, the, for if you, if you go back in the NVC archives, I'm sure you can find our previous episode with, with Julian from 290 years ago, uh, where he talks <laughs> <laughs> a little bit about the history of Factor 5, but you guys were kind of, you came from the demo programming scene. Yeah. If we can call it euphemistically, that the the demo programming scene, right? Yes. Also, also, um, I think highly invested in making really, really nice intros um, for games that uh, were being cracked um, to be pirated easily. Um, is, is the statute of limitations, are you safe? Like, um, I'm not going to drag I, you out I of this think, room. Now. I think I'm pretty good. Yeah. So dan <laughs> dancing rainbows and techno music. And, yeah. <laughs> that that is true. Yeah. Yeah. But you you brought up uh, Factor Five. Are we going to see this company again? 
Um, yeah, we're we're very actively um, exploring that. I mean, um, we all have our day jobs currently um, at Hulu, obviously, um, because the the old gang. Lots of people have been asking. Um, so, what are these? Um, what are the folks doing? And and where did they spread out? Well, we didn't spread out. We we stayed together all of those years. Still the same bedroom uh, with the teddy bear <laughs> on the pillows. And <laughs> obviously, we moved over to Marin <laughs> County at some yeah. point. But no, I mean the um, the company um, in Cologne still exists. Um, we are still up in Marin, um, and actually um, not very far from from Skywalker Ranch um, so not all that much has changed we're working on different stuff but currently. you did mo under the name touch factor you did uh, some mobile stuff right? we did mobile some mobile stuff yeah we did touch fish um, which was a free-to-play uh, mobile um, pet game um, so we did that um, and we did lots and lots and lots of the of the um, video apps that you guys have been using on many many systems over the years um, we did some of the early Netflix um, versions for the Nintendo systems and others where's our Netflix um, I cannot comment on any Netflix <laughs> <laughs> but exist. you can come on, on Hulu, which literally launched this morning, uh, kind of like surprisingly in Nintendo's press release. They were like, oh, Hulu. I was like reading all the games and I was like, Hulu, is that like a weird match three puzzle indie game? And I was like, oh, no, that's the video streaming service. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, so mm -hmm. why why now? Why today? Why not at launch, I guess? like um, Why not at launch? That was a that was a political decision um, by Nintendo to a certain degree, um, but also a technical one. Mm -hmm. um, because they really wanted to focus on um, the game side of things on the one hand. And, and secondly, um, really only were able to provide the basic technical functionality that you needed to make the greatest games um, on the new console. So um, one of the things um, which was missing until recently um, was one tiny little bit of uh, encryption um, that uh, most of the uh, professional um, video services unfortunately need. Mm. Um, and uh, once that was unblocked for us, it was uh, not a problem to, to get the whole thing going. Um, we, had the, we had the streaming actually and, and most of the tech um, we had done um, quite a while ago. It was really... So is the a codec just like the... I mean, there's an Apple TV issue with supplying... Uh 4K content for some applications is that is that the same kind of story with this machine? Oh no 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 not at yeah. all. It's completely different. Okay. No, I mean this is this is on the very um, basic HDMI um, connector um, level because uh, there are certain things which games don't need necessarily, okay. um, but which um, a service like Hulu or also I assume Netflix um, and and Amazon um, needs just in terms of digital rights protection. And um, that was while it was on the hardware, it was always in the hardware of the Switch. Um, uh, that simply wasn't enabled yet. And that's, you know, 1080p, obviously. There, there were rumors before this machine launched that it could do pass-through 4K um, for video streaming. You guys tinker with that at all? No, we didn't tinker um, at all with, with anything like that. Um, I mean, for us, it was always very obvious and, and pretty straightforward that you have the 720p when you're in, in um, undocked mode, and in yep. docked, you've got 1080p. Yep. So, yeah. Well, that's cool. Uh, but F Factor Five, so it still floats out there. <laughs> yes. I was just, I was just watching our team play Star Wars Battlefront, right? Yeah. And then yeah, I, I saw it out in the lobby. Yeah, and I look at it; it looks yeah. beautiful. Obviously, mm. you guys created space combat the way we imagined it would look after watching the movies, right? Like they, they really wasn't before Rogue Squadron. There wasn't a game that looked like that. And when you first showed us Rogue Leader, I'm like, oh my god, that's what Star Wars looks like. That's yeah. what the Death Star trench run looks like. No, as like a quick aside, uh, I mean, I, I get to, I'm very lucky at this job. I get to interview a lot of people who work on the games that are coming out every single day. Uh, it's not often I get to meet somebody that like legitimately influenced the games I was playing all through college. The Rogue <laughs> games were like. As a huge Star Wars fan, the Rogue mm. games were incredibly important to me. Uh, yeah. So thank you for making those. But also they were <laughs> they were sort of like these amazing showcases of technology. Uh, I think that you guys were capable of pulling off stuff that we didn't know was even possible on GameCube. And in, in, in many ways also sort of uh, changing the conversation that the GameCube was underpowered and that it would only do cartoony and children's graphics. You, you could know? see, I mean, at the time we saw games like Racer, for example, Episode One Racer. And before that, you know, we saw Shadows of the Empire. That mm -hmm. definitely was a difference when we looked at your game. But so now here we are today. I'm watching uh, Battlefront Space Combat. I'm like, oh, man, that brings back memories of Rogue Leader. And then I look at this machine and there's no Star Wars game on it. I know. Oh, isn't that a shame? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the same. <laughs> what, what, what about that unreleased game you guys did? What, you oh, can't... Rogue Squadron and Wii. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, let, shall we just say um, it's something which? Oh, yeah, right. You dug out the uh, the footage which we released at some point. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's definitely something we, in some way, shape, or form, which would should really come out of the archives. And um, I mean, all of the things that 
I think prevented that um, back in 2009 when we when we finished the game um, should be out of the way nowadays. So I think it's just about the willingness of probably um, us spending some time on it, um, uh, Disney Lucasfilm um, playing along with it, and then probably EA must be a little bit in the mix. But we'll see sure. about that. Yeah, I was gonna say because like obviously Lucas Games, the the company that released uh, all these games. Yeah, Lucas Lucas Arts. Lucas so, Arts. Sorry, the last uh, one was Lucas Arts. I'm, I'm actually I'm, wearing I'm, I'm wearing a Maniac. Mentioned nice hell yeah here. so um, i i used to <laughs> i played lucasfilm games games back in the di day like yeah. eidolon and rescue yeah. and fractalism and, and maniac that. mansion nice. yeah this and is maniac this mansion. is this is authentic back from 86 so this you, i'm mostly stoked that i can still wear it this rogue <laughs> game for for nintendo wii was completed effectively right or it close? is no not not even um effectively but it, it was completed it was done it went it went through uh nintendo qa it went through uh lucas did did extensive qa we did qa so it was done yeah it was and ready so to I, be released. I almost hate to bring this up but like mm. ea just canceled a the new visceral star wars game you yeah. know the sort of the the amy hennig's third third person sort mm. of uncharted meets star wars game uh that studio got gutted and moved around um what's it like being in a room when a star wars game get canceled i mean <laughs> Uh, Not to evoke such miserable wow, memories, wow. but wow. I mean, you're twisting the knife. <laughs> man. I mean, like I, you know, it's not often I get to sit down with someone who's no, no, like, that's true. You no, know. no, I mean, you you probably remind me of the worst uh, period of my of my <laughs> professional. I tend to do that with people, professional if not personal <laughs> life. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> nice so, to meet you. <laughs> yeah, that's Thanks for good. coming to do our show. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, it was a huge blow, and and to this day, um, I mean, we had we had a few team members, or um, a lot of the team members actually either went um, on then and are not in games anymore um, or uh, basically have retired or and, and that sometimes due to illness and a lot of them are, are saying it's the best work which we ever did and I'm um, personally convinced and everybody who did get a chance to play the game um, is of the opinion that it's probably the best game um, we ever made so, so, um, it's, so double, it's double hard in that respect. So your answer is that the, it, it was so difficult and miserable that some people on the team actually retired from video games forever. That's yes. Yeah. Flat out. Oh, I mean, man. I, 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 I personally, Jeez. I personally wasn't ready um, to jump into triple a or basically even contemplate. Um, I mean, I would still say it would be a hard road uh, back to triple a and I really um, wouldn't, I wouldn't know if we would be prepared to do that again. Um, but um, but I was personally, for a year or two, was completely out of it. We were happy doing Netflix and right. doing Amazon and doing Hulu and all of these things um, that we did um, because you could focus on the on the tech. Um, the companies were large enough that you didn't have to worry about any politics whatsoever. And and um, we were more or less uh, completely switched off from the creative process. And and that was needed because it's it's really heartbreaking. And, so the, and, but that <clears> game. So so the, the game it was uh, it was a best of right it, it had uh, it had the entire it, last game it was the original vision that we had for um, the ultimate Star Wars game that we always wanted to do but then Rogue Leader of course on, on Rogue Squadron um, the on, for the N64 um, Skywalker Ranch at the time didn't want to have any tie-ins with the movies directly so we right. were in the classic universe but we had to come up with an original storyline um, then when Rogue Squadron was so successful then luckily enough they allowed that we could actually tie uh, directly into into um, bits from the movies um, straight up. And that then was Rogue Leader, but we only had nine months, right, uh, due to the launch title. So what was missing in Rogue Leader um, and what should have been in there was really then in the in the third Rogue game, which was Rebel Strike. But there yeah. was also a lot of filler content and um, ill-conceived uh, decisions by the director, which happened to be me. Um, so I take I take uh, <laughs> this I take all, full responsibility for <laughs> this. Is all pre Disney. This is pre the is gutting pre of the Disney. expanded universe canon, which I imagine it's even more. I mean, one of the things I was reading in Kotaku's breakdown of the visceral story was that if you want to get a you know a character characters like belt approved yeah. it's got to go through the story group it's got to go through all this stuff yeah, you guys have to experience any stuff like that or oh, of course it yep. was always like that no i mean the um when they when um lucas arts basically uh, gave us back then the, the the keys to the kingdom um that we could work on star wars it was especially in the beginning it was painful going back and forth with lucasfilm licensing because yes of course they had they even back then they had complete control over every single detail just like like uh, disney's lucasfilm um, has nowadays and um and it was painful, but it really paid off that our games, especially after the first Rogue, was so successful. And people acknowledged the fact that we deeply, deeply cared about Star Wars. Um, and thus, 
um, we didn't make any mistakes. I mean, every single thing that we ever ran by licensing back then, they immediately approved because we had a certain neck and love, first of all, love for the franchise. So we would have never done anything that wouldn't have fit the franchise, but also a certain talent to actually, if you do variations on it, then at least needs it needs to feel like Star Wars. And I think we had a pretty unique talent in that respect, which probably was pure German obsessiveness. Didn't um, you have it. one of your rogue games had a unlock car that you could drive through space? Uh, no, every single, practically every single Factor 5 game, I believe, since the 3D era um, had the same unlockable car. I just wanted to was point out, you a yes. programmer's car? Or yeah. <laughs> no, our, one of our sound uh, sound and, and video post production guys, uh, yeah. Rudy, oh. Rudolf yeah. Stemba, yeah. Um, his, his, uh, his Buick, uh, 68 Buick. Yeah, was and so this is what I love because yeah. you guys were so <laughs> perfectly detail oriented. <laughs> I still retain that I think you've done probably the best Battle of Hoth that we've ever seen in a game. Oh, yeah. uh, and you are talking <laughs> about how, much. how specific you were and how on the books you were. No, you you, you have did never. We did we did um, create the best Battle of Hoth by a long shot ever in a game, and nobody has ever played it except for my kids and a few testers at Lucas Arts because. Um, Actually, in Rogue We, we merged together um, the the Rogue Leader um, Battle of Hoth and the one um, the level which was actually on the ground partially and partially in 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 the clouds in Rebel Strike completely remixed the whole thing and then put our um, uh, next generation lighting engine and everything on there. And in low res, the whole thing doesn't look uh, or to this day, if you fire up the the debug Wii that I have um, with the game, um, it doesn't look all that different. Um, from the newest Battlefront, um, mm. because we had we had global illumination um, pulled off on the Wii and and a lot of crazy things just that low nobody res. Uh, just low res, yeah, which used yeah. to be high res yeah. back then. Yeah, <laughs> what, what, no, 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 even even back then. I mean, we're we're talking 2009 here, but uh -huh. yeah, people people oh, right. would have been absolutely utterly blown away. I want to play this so bad. Oh, yeah, and it is it, it it is absolutely I would say the the best Battle of Hoth ever done. <sighs> we gotta yeah. do it. Well, well, next time you come on the show, when you're a debug unit. Yeah, we gotta do a let's play. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You get you on expert <laughs> mode, so man, that'd be awesome. Yeah, uh, that's cool. But I mean, you, you guys have um, you, you guys have a bigger back catalog than that. Obviously, you've got the Turrican games. Mm -hmm. Did you, do you worked on indie as well, right? Yeah, we um, we did. Uh, that was our first collaboration, actually, with uh, Lucas Arts. Was Indiana Jones' Greatest Adventures for the Super Nintendo, mm -hmm. um, which was on the Virtual Console. Actually, I was stoked about that. Um, it was great that they worked that out. And uh, and then later on, we did a an extremely painful reinvention port. Um, of the PC, Indiana Jones uh, and the Infernal Machine, which was uh, fundamentally a Tomb Raider clone. Yeah. And uh, and we actually brought that to the N64 um, and we almost um, bit off more than um, we could swallow in that case. Um, it was really, really tough to do it. But it was fun because we completely reinvented the mechanics of the game. Um, Lucas allowed us to basically um, say we essentially use the, the level design and the characters and everything and the graphics as they are and the story, but we completely redid control and everything to make it more like Ocarina of Time. Um, so yeah, that, that was, was that, that was, was like one of the fun. more ambitious N64 games. And before you mm -hmm. joined us today, we were talking about uh, the new Doom, po uh, the Port of Doom, mm -hmm. and Alien Noir, and Rocket League, uh, all very ambitious games uh, performing on underperforming hardware. Effectively, when you port a game like that. Um, What's what are some of the first things that die basically? What are the first things that have to sort of hit the cutting room floor? Um, it's less about the cutting room floor. It's about the um, you you look um, at the original, and we done uh, we've done quite a few ports. We did R Type, for example, um, back then the the um, arcade game um, port um, to a home computer, which is even more painful than than um, something like this. And um, the first thing is you find the essence, and what you you really have to look in a port at um, what is the essence of what you're playing and what you're looking at and then you very quickly find things that the normal person probably would never see if you tone it down a little bit here or if you cut a little bit there and then you just start cutting out certain things and in other areas you suddenly find find stuff where you can improve on it I mean back back on indie for example the PC version didn't have real-time lighting and um, our n64 uh, microcode engine actually could do that so we just switched it on so we suddenly had real-time light and shadows in a game which was never built for that on the other hand and of course, the textures got somewhat chopped down. Right. Um, but if you're clever about it, then you can do, um, you get down to the spirit of the port. Um, somebody just, um, I think, on, on some internet forum um, actually um, 
spoke about the fact that they always appreciated the Factor Five ports because we also did, for example, Contra uh, Contra Three: The Alien Wars, which was uh, the Super Nintendo Contra for the Game Boy. Um, and of course, you would say this is crazy, um, but if you play it, um, it very much feels like the same thing. Um, and of course, it's got less sprites and everything. The Game Boy was vastly more primitive, but you actually acknowledge it's Contra Three. Whereas if you play um, I don't know, Street Fighter 2, for example, they attempted a port of that. Mm -hmm. It's just god-awful. And that's because they didn't get the spirit of the right, game right, right and the feel of the game. Mortal Kombat Advance, yeah. historically, is like one of the one of the worst ports in video game history. And I think that's yeah. completely uh, sort of like leans in exactly what you're saying. There. And for us, I mean, for us, ports always were on all, every single port that we did um, was more or less a, um, uh, a little bit of an exercise, almost like playing an instrument, because we most Mostly um, did original games, of course, but the ports were a fun way of oh, let's look at some other creators' uh, creation and let's try to um, understand the spirit behind it. I mean, I got an um, I had an extreme kick uh, doing an official port of Contra Three because I loved that game, of mm. course. You guys also um, did Animaniacs. Right? We did Animaniacs, which, yeah, which, which, which came Boy. which came from from the Genesis actually. Yeah. That was a Genesis game, and we um, uh, we ported that. Um, that was our Konami um, story. And we almost did Castlevania. We wanted to do <sighs> Castlevania, yeah, wow. and then and then uh, Konami Osaka, I believe, um, shut that down um, because they they wanted to do something themselves, and I, I don't think they ever did. Um, I mean, you you. Uh, no offense, but you're an old Nintendo head, right? You've, you've, <laughs> you've grown up with Nintendo, Nintendo machines before that. Amiga, yeah. obviously. Yeah. You, you guys, whenever whenever I met the team, mm. there was this this real passion for figuring out how to get the most out of these machines, the N64 and the GameCube. And like, there was even a phase where you guys worked very closely with Nintendo on you know uh, video compression and sound compression, all that kind of stuff, getting right. really um, unprecedented MIDI uh, music out of the machines as well. Do you ever miss it? You guys even pitched like uh, Kid Icarus and Pilot Wings to Nintendo. Like, do you miss that relationship? I, I cannot comment on that. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but um, we, we've seen we've seen uh, art floating around the internet. But like, do you miss working closely I, with? Uh, I with still Nintendo? can't comment on. Oh, that. you can. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No, I won't. Um, no, no, no. But but the Nintendo relationship, of course. Um, look, it's the same people still. Um, I mean, um, uh, I was I was just in Kyoto actually um, at Nintendo a few weeks ago. Um, um, and and in a way the same thing. When I'm up, up in Seattle, um, we oftentimes meet, um, and and some of those guys, um, and and we go back. Oh God, 25 years by yeah. now. Um, yeah. Because um, I mean, Nintendo is also a company which loses very few people. Um, and um, on the other hand, we always stuck together as a team um, in whatever incarnation um, we were around. Um, so you actually just built this long, 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 long relationship. And I I think that's partially probably the reason why why um, Hulu is the first. Uh, streaming service um, in terms of launch, uh, simply because um, uh, as, as a side effect of having known these companies, and the same goes for Sony, by the way, yeah. um, because we were also part of, of Mark Cerny's team um, back on the PS3 um, uh, launch. Um, let's not forget about that. Um, so, um, so yeah, we, we always get access um, pretty early, um, even nowadays. Of course, we don't need it quite as early uh, these mm -hmm. days um, as game guys do, um, because it's a little bit easier to, uh, to get the streaming service up and running. Um, but nevertheless, that relationship is still there. Absolutely. Is that how we saw the some sort of, and this is a tangent, but some of the sort of uh, PSVR stuff that worked its way in the Hulu app? Uh, the uh, Yeah, the Hulu, um, all of the Hulu um, VR apps, um, uh, anything in that field is actually um, uh, being done in Marin. Oh, cool. Um, that's part yeah, of my we, team. Yeah, like, yeah. You could watch yeah. Hulu on a virtual beach, basically, or a movie theater or stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And none of the other streaming services were doing that. So that, that's interesting that you can bring that kind of stuff to the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and it's a it's a lot of fun. Um, I mean, um, same same thing. We talked to Sony very early on. Um, I know the guys who, who actually did a lot of the R&D behind the yeah. PS. VR um, headset um, back from the day, um, and um, we just said, "Can we play around with it?" And they said, well, "Why your your streaming service?" And we still said, "Yeah, but but there might be something interesting there." So, so you already you you said you said I'm not sure if I'm ready to jump into triple A or if 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 you ever <laughs> want to go back into it. But if you had a dream project and you wanted mm -hmm. to pursue, like if you said, "All right, I'm going to get the gang back together, we'll get the band back together, <laughs> we're going to make a game for Twitch or any console," what what would right. you go after? Um, I mean, my my immediate dream would be actually to do um, to to first port uh, basically what we had on on um, Broke Squad and Wii um, to the Switch because the Switch, in terms of input um, uh, characteristics, is pretty much the only console which would be no. We um, so. 
Um, Rogue Squadron, we actually supported every single input device. Um, so in spirit, it was very uh, comparable to um, what Nintendo did um, with uh, Mario Odyssey or um, even more so Mario Kart, actually. It's probably, we took a big inspiration from, from Mario Kart, which even at the time you could play with the hardcore controller, with the GameCube mm -hmm. controller. But it had motion controls for yes, the lightsabers and it had, you could play well, in an okay, alternate for the, mode? For the, for, the, for the lightsabers, the whole uh, subsection with the lightsaber dueling, you could only play um, with a motion plus, um, uh, which was the gyro, um, because we needed one-to-one -one mapping. Um, and we actually expanded greatly in terms of the lightsaber um, dueling on what we Sports Resort did, because they did relatively simple blocking and everything. We had force powers in there, um, and we had um, more levels of blocking, so it was a lot more sophisticated uh, than that. Um, and uh, and so um, the, the Switch would be the only um, console really currently in terms of input characteristics where you could port the game to. And then you would, th then you would really want to get the gang together and probably contact I mean they're all around um, our our lead artists who did all of the um, who did the the look oh so unbelievably right um, and basically spent uh, spent half his time at Skywalker Ranch um, designing for George um, on the movies actually and the other half of the day um, uh, drawing the textures um, for us um, is now at Pixar so um, mm. but it's only a, a stone throw away so right. I'm, I'm sure we could get these guys together and actually do a really nice uprest version the models uh, still hold up. Up. Yeah. Um, the highest. Textures, I mean, it was designed for 480p, right? Um, exactly. No, 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 no. So um, it was. It, it, it's okay in 1080p. Um, okay. The models still hold up because um, it, our highest resolution model, actually, of the X-Wing, which we did use um, in in the Wii version, finally, um, because we had enough memory for it. If you got really close with the camera, that was, um, uh, I believe, almost 30,000 polygons. Mm. Um, it's in a that, single is shit. It, is it seen mm. in yeah. that cutscene? You guys recreated yes, that when the, side when the shot? Yes, yeah. when, when the we camera... We saw that earlier. Um, when the yeah. camera gets... Yeah, but that, that, isn't, um, that isn't the final Final um, Wii version, which okay. we did. Um, the the final Wii version, um, the, the the models hold up so well that you can really drive your camera into the cockpit, um, pretty much. I don't think that um, that on those models you you would see much of a difference compared to what what EA created later later I think on. That surprises a lot of people, myself included, when they um, when you see video games from Nintendo platforms get ripped through emulation software. I think mm -hmm. Dolphin's one of the ones that that people use on high end PCs. Right. When you go in and actually see that a lot of the character models and textures go in into it uh, looking fantastic and then the resolution that it, like say something like the Wii or the 3DS spits out at the end um, kind of blurs that a little bit but there's there's yeah. a really beautiful game underneath all <laughs> <laughs> I think you always have that um, a little bit you had it in, in 480p and you certainly have it with the um, uh, I mean the 3DS had, had certain rendering characteristics which were somewhere in between a I'd say a PlayStation 2 and um, I mean it could do powerful shaders but on the same level it didn't really sample uh, the individual pixels at a very nice quality mm, sure. and with that you get exactly what you described which is um, a little bit gets lost. On the other hand, I was always amazed what the 3DS for for what the chip um, was able to do in there. Oh, yeah. So we never worked on it, but um, we, we we had it. Well, we actually did. We did uh, we did um, a couple of streaming services on it. So oh, cool. We, um, should, we should take a quick vote. Who's who's uh, who votes yes for releasing Rogue Squadron on the Oh, the 100, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm yes. for it. Yeah. Anybody Make anybody watching happen. maybe want to <laughs> see this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I we know. decided, <laughs> Julian. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I don't know where all that falls in like the in the legal mind. <laughs> Field of like <laughs> Disney and Star Wars and Lucas and and the games that they're working on. Before legal that legal legal minefield is putting it mildly. Really? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean the whole thing. How, how the whole thing fell apart in in 2009 definitely rubbed a, lo a lot of people um, the wrong way. At the end of the day, it was it probably would have needed a little bit of courage from somebody um, to step up um, on on that level. But it's really hard to. Um, to get that back to life um, again, we're certainly up for it. And and anything which happened back then has been resolved a long time ago. Mm. So the time would be right for it. Um, the big question is: um, is, is anybody at, at Disney slash Lucasfilm um, and or EA, if they have to be involved, um, up for the whole thing? But um, you never know. You never should say never. Well, when you're ready, let us know uh, which congressman to write to, <laughs> and, and we'll we'll ask our fans. I can give you phone numbers to help. Oh. Congresswoman right. Kathleen Kennedy. Yeah, write to yeah. Kathleen Kennedy. Exactly. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, well, we only have a few minutes left here of the show, but before we wrap things up, we did want to go over the news here. Um, so it looks like 
the other day was just the last day of the Meverse. It is officially Aww. over, Aww. unfortunately. Um, so hopefully you guys had fun um, checking in. If you did check in, um, I know that a couple of my friends were on there making some crazy stuff happen. Um, Brian, did you get a chance to? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I I have such fond memories of Meverse. Uh, I think it meant a different thing to so many different people, which was cool about it. For some people, it was this awesome art gallery. Yeah. Right. For others, it was um, easily and quickly accessible game help. You you could get stuck mm -hmm. in something and pull up a community of people. For others, it was a source of memes, such as uh, why why doesn't Metroid crawl? You know, uh, <laughs> which Metroid was people playing place. Metroid for the first time and not knowing how Samus fit into small barriers because they didn't know if you just go left at the beginning of Metroid, you become a ball and it's, yeah. it's all good. Um, and, and that Samus's name is not. Metroid. Yeah, and I was reading about the sort of the last few hours of Meverse. I think there's something fascinating when an online community closes its doors at the very end. And there, I remember there was like reading about like Halo, the original Halo, going offline and people uh, sort of like creating a server for it and then just staying in it for as long as possible like cuz they don't want to say goodbye and there's something beautiful and tragic <clears throat> about that that lasted like weeks or yeah, months very right? very long yeah. time and i, I think there was that. like some guy had like a it's like a power out in his house or something and then the halo online was over <laughs> like, oh no <laughs> yeah that stuff is so interesting to me so i really hope um like most things that we say goodbye to in nintendo land i hope it's because they're ushering in a successor at some point you know i would like to see something like Meverse on Switch um, that sort of uh, collates all of the fun things and and art and uh, game help and, and community that that successfully worked there. Uh, There's some stuff like if you go into yeah, Splatoon the 2, for example. The, yeah. the community, absolutely. I mean, I think some of the spirit, you're absolutely right, is in the marketplace um, in the Splatoon game. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that that's definitely inspired by it. Um, I, th I think if there was one thing which, which um, uh, if they do it in the in the future, it should not be the first thing that gets loaded up when you switch on um, the, yeah. the system. I think that was a big problem. And th one of the things which really got me stoked was when I had the first experience with the OS. Um, of the Switch because we were so skeptical. Would they have a slow, long-loading um, operating system again? And Nintendo had promised us that, no, no, when we saw that as a big mistake and we really want to make it snappy this time. So when when I experienced it the first time, I was I was in heaven. I was like, yeah, give, give me rather less features, yeah. but make it snappy, make it immediately accessible. But from there, you could easily then go into something like Miiverse as, as your hub. Um, just don't make it the first screen. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm sad to see it go. I really do hope that we get something like that on Switch. It would be nice to have like a community driven type um, place where we could all congregate and help each other. Mm -hmm. sure. um, but along that, um, we also have some new Fire Emblem Warriors content. It's actually free and it's coming out November 16th. I believe it's a new character. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out if you're into Fire Emblem Warriors. But more importantly, we do also have um, a bunch of new games that are coming out this week alongside of what we just mentioned, Doom. But uh, we Brian, also... Brian played them all? Yes, Brian, I know, played <laughs> a bunch. You actually gave me a code for one of them, Cat Quest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want, I'm, you guys really, made that up. That I, doesn't really... I just want to go on the record right now. When Brian <laughs> gave me this code, I sort of... Like, I don't know, I made fun of the game's name. I didn't take it seriously. But then I went home and I actually played the game and played it for like five hours straight. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's it really was fun. super good. I, yeah, I think that I was like 5% hazing you, but 95% like, hey, I think this is going to be a cool game. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I try to stay on top of indie stuff and I was like, maybe I'll, uh, Philip can, I, I'll pass the torch a little bit. He That's can awesome. That. So, yeah. yeah, Cat Quest, it's a sort of like open world ish RPG. Uh, I believe it was an iOS game. It was also on Steam. And uh, it's really fun, very hack and slashy. It's very like arcade RPG. It's simple um, but addictive. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, it's, it's, I'm, sometimes I just need like a mindless game to play on my Switch while I'm watching a TV show. And like grinding and leveling up in this game is really fun. The dungeons are really fun. Um, it's just, really just, cool. Yeah, if you go in with like your expectations tempered, um, you know, and if you like grinding for gear and leveling up and all that stuff, yep. you'll probably enjoy this game. So, I mean, nice. definitely think about getting it. Um, also, Snipper Clip. Plus is another game that's coming out this week, and they've officially finally added Pro Controller support. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that I thought and I felt pretty seriously about was missing from Snipper Clips. I don't like it when Nintendo kind of forces us to do yeah. things against our will, like you know, use Joy Cons or use motion controls. <laughs> um, but I'm not, um, I'm not commenting on that. <laughs> having, having worked on the, on Lair, oh, oh, too soon. Hey, that was eventually. Too Fixed, too right? soon. That, that was eventually no. What what always was fixed was eventually released. 
Uh, there, there is a nasty back story to that one. All right. <laughs> um, but just kind of quickly going over some more games. Um, <laughs> we've got Ben 10. That's also coming out um, this week as well. But then starting early in the ne- next week, uh, Rhyme, November uh, 14th. L.A. Noir, November 14th. All of these games are coming out on the 14th. Uh, Batman, the Telltale Series, Rocket League, Little Do, and Pinball FX. So... Yeah. We've got a lot of stuff coming out in the, in the next week. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, last week we just had a huge dump of games as well. So it's just continuing to flow. I mean, not, not, not like we're busy with Mario Odyssey still. Yeah. Well, Mario Odyssey and you should spend your time watching TV on Hulu. Oh, yes. that's Sports. definitely. Yeah. 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 I know. Mario Odyssey uh, and The Handmaid's Tale. Just, Handmaid, just like yes. this. Perfect. <laughs> Handmaid's Tale. I still I haven't seen that. I hear only good things Ex- about that. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Really, really proud of, of the Emmy as well. If, um, you, if you marathon through the whole season in one day, you can actually unlock her outfit in Mario Odyssey. That is so terrible. Yeah. <laughs> really, that's a lie. Don't believe that. Don't write into me. It's li- I'm lying. It's fake. Um, so, yeah, every week we answer a question from you, the listeners. So, this question, um, and also our email is nvc at ign.com. So, if you have a question, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can also just leave a comment uh, wherever we accept comments. Um, this one, this week's question comes from William Ramos. Uh, he asks, so, now that we've all played Mario Odyssey a bit more extensively and know... And now that the honeymoon phase is starting to wane, how do you feel about it, and where does this rank with the rest of the other Mario platformers, 3D platformers only or overall? Oh, man, that's a great question. I feel like we could we could do we could fold this a lot into the spoiler cast we do on Mario Odyssey, which, which we're is getting coming. To. Yeah. Um, I, I keep going back and forth on this being like my favorite 3D Mario game ever made, while also simultaneously missing some of the direction that a game like 64 had, for example. Yeah. I feel like it's almost a little too... Um, uh, it feels like being in a big department store sometimes and not really knowing which aisle you need to go shopping yeah. in and it, wanting a bunch of things but not knowing where to go. Uh, whereas Mario 64 is sort of just like, get to the top. And you're like, oh, okay, I can do that. And while you're there, you can collect coins and other stuff. So, And, and I, I felt it was, I mean, Mario 64 was actually not linear, right? It had all these paintings you could jump into. But I felt like it it kind of funneled you a little bit more. Whereas like Odyssey, once you get to this part and, you know, you're done with the main quest, you have all these levels unlocked, you're just like, oh, my God, what am I going to do next? And so you spend a little time here, a little time there. Yeah. Then you run into an impossible challenge. I have to say, for me, the honeymoon period is not over. I'm yeah. just under 600 yeah. moons. I feel like I'm going to keep on playing. I just flew, again, yesterday, I flew to L.A., brought this thing with me, did a couple of moons in the airplane, and on the way back, it's a battery hog, though. Did Bring it, your I brick. Can, I can second that, yeah. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm not even as deeply into it as you. I'm I'm in, uh, I think, in the 300 moons or something. Yep. But it's um, the, the, the only criticism that I would level, um, and it really was gorgeous, and I still prefer 64, but I think that's more for the unbelievable shock of what they did yeah. back then. Yep. Never underestimate that. That, that is not repeatable. No, um, no. That, I mean, that, we, that, 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 that ushered in a new dimension of gaming. Right. Like, we were right. just jumping so, in that tree in the beginning, just going like, yeah, oh, just, oh, just oh, going oh, yeah. Oh, but oh, I had then. I had a little bit of that feeling, I have to say, and none of the interim ones, even even Galaxy, um, as, as brilliant as it was, didn't have that immediate joy of the controls, um, which they brought back with this one. And and I've been, I spent in that first area actually probably um, uh, about as much time as I did back then on, on 64, just yeah. playing around with the controls and I was blown away because um, all of the previous um, especially 3D world I just took the control for granted and just played the game whereas here I purely saw the controls and the brilliance of it and all of the different moves as a game in itself just encountering them uh, by by themselves so I think that's the level that Cappy brings hmm. into it right this sort yes. of just like yeah. everything has almost felt like an evolution of Mario 64 which in itself was an evolution of the move set that Mario had in Mario vs Donkey Kong which weirdly enough is the first time he ever went to a city that was Donkey Kong themed so mm-hmm. you're welcome new Donkey <laughs> City uh, but now with Cappy I mean I it took me about 10 hours into the game to figure out that 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 hat throw into the hat dive into the jump off of the hat into second hat throw yep. and you can cover football fields <laughs> yes. doing that and that is kind of a game changer for a lot of things um, and even like sort of the Cooper races right and adding that level of verticality and, uh, and and distance that you can throw in there makes them so much fun to play and so much fun to watch what a perfect learning curve I mean it's you you don't know the hat jump move in the beginning yeah and you know you can be you can be 300 moons in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, be having fun still. with that game, but you don't know how to execute this every time. 
And uh, then you discover it and you do it and, and you realize, oh my God, there are all these challenges centered around that very move. And by the end of the game, they expect you to do yeah. that yeah. stuff, right? Like once you're on the redacted or you go to the redacted level, you have to do that stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, and then they play perfectly to that nostalgia of Mario 64, Sunshine, you know, like that, uh, the the th 3D heydays for Mario. Um, yeah, I love that game. I'm, I'm going to keep on playing it's a, it. It's a brilliant yeah. game. I am yeah, saying in some challenges, I'm flipping the game off a little oh, bit. God, there are yeah. some really tough ones um, that, again, we'll get into in the spoiler cast. Uh, well, like Zach Ryan was, it was uh, texting me last night, and he was like, you know, I think this might be my game of the year. And I... When I had left him at the office that day, he was screaming at his Switch. Yeah. And I think that's amazing because <laughs> it it does give you that weird abusive relationship of like, this is pushing back so hard and it's really challenging you. But when he when you get that moon, it's victory. And it's, everything's it's great. Victory. It yeah. truly feels so unbelievably good. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm torn between I mean, my game of the year clearly is either that or Zelda. Yeah. And I'm still extremely torn. I mean, I'm still unbelievably impressed just how open world they actually made Zelda mm -hmm. and how little imposed. Because that that would be my one single criticism on um uh, on on Mario, that it feels that first campaign um uh, playthrough of the main story feels a tad too linear compared to yeah. <laughs> to 64 back then. 64 yep. has a strangely more open feeling. Yep. And I think Zelda nailed that a little bit more, um, yep. that they that they gave even more freedom in the beginning. But again, I mean, we're, we're talking... Um, well, it's granular at that point. Nuance between right? so two amazing games. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. Uh, you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, we'll be talking about Mario Odyssey for years. So Absolutely. And we do definitely have a spoiler cast coming up, so definitely make sure you stick around for that. I'm sure that's going to be happening in the next few sure. days very, very soon. But but thank you very much, Julian, for joining us. It was sure. awesome Always having a pleasure. you here. Please come back very soon. Hopefully <laughs> with that Wii Dev Kit and uh, Pop Rogue. We shall um, see about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, the, that's going to be it for episode 381 of Nintendo Voice Chat. Thank you all for joining us. And always remember to come back next week. And definitely, if you have any questions, email us at the email. And goodbye. Get see you soon. Thing.